people aren't quoting you, if you're not out there in the public domain and expressing views, you know, you're not credible, you don't have a brand and you need that brand and credibility uh, to be able to uh, establish, uh, you know, the, the trust in what you're saying and, and maintain that perception of being unbiased. You, you want to be unbiased, but it's also really key that there's a perception of being unbiased and that goes back to your credibility and all those other things that we were talking about and that, that I do is an effort to establish and maintain that credibility. I am J.B. Wogan from Mathematica and welcome back to On the Evidence. We have a very special guest for you today, Mark Sandy, the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. Mathematica's president and CEO, Paul Decker, is stepping in as the guest host for this episode. Mark and Paul discuss immigration reform, artificial intelligence, labor shortages, the merits of pursuing a non-academic career in economic research, and influencing politically charged policy debates with data and credibility. If you like this episode, you may want to check out the podcast that Mark co-hosts, which is called Moody's Talks Inside Economics. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Mark, thank you for joining me for the Audi Evidence podcast. I've watched and listened to you for many years, and I'm really interested in your professional journey. You and I share a common background in that we're similar in age, and we earned economics PhDs, yet we both chose non-academic careers. How do you think about your career path and how it reflects your interest in economics and data? And why did you choose a non-academic career? Oh, boy. Um... Well, it's good to be with you, Paul. Thanks for the opportunity. That's a big question. Uh, and uh, where'd you get your PhD? At Johns Hopkins. Oh, great university. My um, uh, deputy chief, I'm the chief economist of Moody's, and uh, my deputy chief economist got his PhD from Johns Hopkins. Uh, yeah. So great, great university. Um, well, uh, the, the uh, question that's easy to answer is why didn't, didn't I become an academic? <laughs> Uh, and that's because I lived in a family of, of academics. My uh, dad was professor of engineering, systems engineering, uh, way back in the day, civil engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. That's where I got my PhD. I did my undergrad work there at the Wharton School and then my PhD. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's a lot to like about the academic lifestyle, but there was a lot I didn't like. Um, and I'm not a very patient person, and I think you need to be a very patient person to be a, a good uh, a teacher, professor, a mentor. So, uh, and then uh, just circumstance, I, uh, when I was getting my PhD, I was working at a firm called uh, Chase Econometrics, which was a, a, a firm that was established um, by a former Penn professor uh, who had been a colleague of Larry, Larry Klein. Larry Klein was a Nobel laureate in economics who uh, kind of um, was the, the father of kind of the econometric modeling work that we do today. Uh, and um, so I was there uh, working uh, to earn money. I also used their mainframe and data to, uh, to uh, do my PhD thesis. And I just got engrossed in the business of the economic forecasting and analysis and, and data work that uh, that firm was doing. and. Uh, been off and running. Uh, soon thereafter, after I got my PhD, I uh, started a, a firm that um, in 1990 that um, uh, that uh, ultimately c competed with Chase Econometrics and Wharton Econometrics and DRI, the other firms in the business. Those firms are no longer with us. They've all been acquired and assumed by others, and you know, kind of been broken apart. But our, our firm has grown. Um, we were acquired by Moody's about uh, around 2005. Uh, so 15 years, we were a privately held company, small business. Uh, by the time we sold, we had 100 employees, and and now we're part of the large uh, multinational organization, the Moody's organization. And we're all about data. Uh, you know, we're very data intensive. We collect data from all over the world. Government sources, trade groups, private other private sources, consortium data consortiums. Uh, we use we clean the data. We uh, 
provide that data to others for their use. Uh, and of course, we use it for our own modeling and, uh, and the work that we do, forecasting, scenario analysis, policy analysis. Uh, uh, and uh, so we're, we're uh, very intensive users of uh, economic, financial, demographic uh, 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 data and information. So that's that's kind of sort of the the, the career path and and why such a focus on uh, on economic information and data. When you chose to go down the non academic path, did you run into any interference uh, from your family or from your advisors uh, no. at UPenn? No, no. I mean, because it was a very you know there was Klein, there there was uh, all the other folks, the uh, academics there were very empirically oriented. They had their own firm, so uh, not. I didn't really. My dad, uh, he uh, he was a very good academic, uh, and uh, but he understood the kind of uh, issues and limitations. He, he actually he was an immigrant from Iran, and uh, you know he left the country because of the political environment. He was the head of the student body at the University of Tehran, so he was very politically active and had to leave because of. Uh, the overthrow of Mossadegh, and so he, you know, if he hadn't made that trip here to the United States, uh, he probably would have ended up being uh, somewhere in the, pop, you know, of course, Iran went down a very different path, but, you know, he might still be part of, you know, what's going on there and not yeah. and not an academic. So, no, I didn't I didn't really receive any resistance. The resistance was economics. My dad, I remember because he's an engineer, civil engineer, systems engineer, he goes, you know, what do you do with an economics degree? That was the question. And of course, I had no answer whatsoever for that. I go, I don't know, but I really enjoy it. So this is what we're going to do. And I think that's, you know, an important lesson. I mean, uh, it's hard to know uh, exactly uh, how these, you know, how these paths play out and what's going to work and what's not going to work. You just got to follow the thing that you're, you're you enjoy and uh, you're, uh, you know, reasonably good at. Yeah. And my father was a theater professor and had a similar oh. question about what do you do with an economics PhD? <laughs> a theater professor? That's interesting. Where, where did he teach? At McMurray College in Illinois, small oh. private college in the Midwest. Oh, that's so cool. So were you, yeah. uh, you must have been on stage then. Uh, no? Uh, no. Uh, you never did that. No, I've, I, I avoided that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's too bad. I bet that would have been uh, that would have been you would have been good, good actor. Well, I appreciate knowing more about your background, uh, and I'm interested in the ways in which uh, you communicate your work. At Mathematica, over the years, we shifted to having more of our focus on how we disseminate our findings and insights, and how we do that as effectively as possible, uh, with the intent that we don't just want to create the evidence. We want to make sure the evidence is as useful and as informative as possible uh, to those who are going to use it, policymakers and other decision makers. And um, one thing you should know about me is that I'm an avid watcher of CNBC and have been since oh. the 1980s. So I know you as a prolific and popular voice on economic data and evidence. And I'd love to hear more about your approach to commuting communicating data insights and influencing decisions. I know you've used a variety of venues to promote evidence. I've seen your name and, and your face and heard your voice everywhere, uh, whether it's uh, through op-eds that you write, appearing on TV, using social media, or through now your weekly podcast. How do you think about the benefits of using those different venues? And have you found that uh, different media that you access reach different audiences that you're trying to to target. Well, um, it's a good question. Uh, thank you. I, I I follow the all of the above strategy. Uh, you know, uh, wh whatever media uh, uh, that is uh, is available, I'll, I'll try to utilize. Uh, in part because I I enjoy uh, you know engaging uh, in all these different. Um, with all these different me approaches, you know, from op-eds to podcasts to, to webinars, and um, I, I tweet, you know, I, I, my handle, and I'll, I'll advertise at Mark Sandy, so I, I've been tweeting. Um, you know, I'm not quick to adopt new uh, 
of forms of communication. Uh, you know, I don't move quickly, but uh, you know, uh, once I see that you know some form of communication is popular and people are listening to it, and you know, I, I, I hear people discussing what they learn from you know the different uh, uh, platforms that they're on. I'll, I'll 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 adapt and adjust and you know start to contribute. Um, you know, clearly each platform media has its different advantages and disadvantages. Um, I mean. Uh, op eds, you know, I write those because, um, uh, you know, they reach policymakers and others that are thinking about these issues that I'm writing about. And, uh, you know, I generally have a point I'd like to make and get across. And so that, but that takes, you know, more energy, more work um, in, in the sense that it's not, uh, you know, I, I try to vet it. Uh, you know, it's an, it's an idea and I send it around to other people and see what they think and, and bring in their suggestions and comments. So it's, it's a fair amount of work. Uh, and of course, the uh, media outlets that publish the op-eds, some are very, um, they, they take what you write pretty much as is, some not so much. You know, they really have a heavy hand in uh, the editorial process. They don't want to change what you're saying, but they, they you know, really uh, pay very close attention to how you say it. Uh, they're very careful about uh, making sure that everything is annotated and, you know, well-documented, that kind of thing. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, and, and by the way, I also write and do more basic kind of research. They're not a peer reviewed academic research, but they're more involved. I call them white papers on specific issues that are kind of, you know, things that I'm deeply interested in, but are kind of in the weeds. Like, so for example, I wrote a paper, and I usually do this with colleagues or both internally and externally, wrote a paper on the federal, there's a lot of controversy around the federal home loan bank system and it's a mission and uh, is that, should there be reforms and that kind of thing. And so I've written a few white papers around that that go, you know, in, into a more detail with regard to, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, that particular issue. Uh, a lot a lot around uh, reform of the of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the GSEs, mortgage finance, housing, those kinds of things. Uh, but th that's very involved, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time and energy. So like right now I'm working on a, a research uh, a piece, white paper on the private credit markets, because that's been a rapidly growing part of the global financial system. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum are things that are just easy, you know, they're fun actually. And, you know, I, I really enjoy like, you know, tweeting, I actually enjoy uh, to some degree. I actually enjoyed it even more when it was 280 characters. <laughs> Uh, because that's actually quite therapeutic. If you want to get down a real, you know, clear thought in 280 characters, that means you got to be quite, you know, you got to really think about what you want to say. You say it very succinctly, clearly, and uh, it's almost like uh, this is overstating the case, but it's almost like writing a haiku. You know, it's like discipline. Yeah, it's a discipline. <laughs> uh, now that they don't have that constraint, that that you know, I still kind of try to stick to the 280 characters because of that discipline. Uh, and then the podcast, I. I just, I just enjoy it. I, I don't really have to prepare for it. You know, I do a little bit of, 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 like I'll write an email the night before or two nights before to the guest if I have a guest and say, hey, this is kind of broadly what I think we'll talk about. What do you think? Any suggestions? Anything you don't want to talk about? So forth and so on. But that's it. And then it's a conversation and we have a lot of fun. And I think it's really good for people really enjoy it. You know, I get a lot of comments from, you know, my clients and other parties, external parties that, uh, you know, listen to the podcast. And it's really good for this, for my staff, right? Because um, they're engaged and we're, we're talking about issues that they're uh, passionate about. And you can see how talented they are and they can express their views in, in a kind of more relaxed way. So I, I found that to be a really uh, effective way of, me, of, uh, of reaching people, but at the same time, really having a lot of fun doing it. Is, is there any particular experience that you can put your finger on where you thought your insights and the way in which you commuted those, it communicated those insights was, uh, was influential? I do testify in Congress, you know, a fair amount, uh, generally more when there's economic issues. And I, I guess if I had to pinpoint one example of, of uh, where I thought I had some impact was in, in generally, you know, congressional hearings are more staged. They're not like where you actually make policy. I mean, people are making points, yeah. but it's, it's not really making policy. 
But there was one hearing in the financial crisis around the auto bailout. If you remember back, the auto industry got a uh, got bailed out during that period, and this was the second auto a bailout hearing. The first one was a disaster because all the CEOs came down in their Lear jets asking for a bailout. I remember. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and people got pretty upset. Uh, so they called a second hearing and then they had the CEOs, the three CEOs of the major companies and they had me, uh, you know, on the, and I remember this because this was a Senate, I think it was Senate banking, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Senate banking. And they were trying to figure out how to do this. You know, first of all, should they do this? Should they bail out the auto industry and how they should do it? And um, uh, I remember it was like a five-hour hearing. And, you know, there's no bathroom breaks. You, you have to. And I'm, I, I didn't know that, you know. And I'm, you know. and I'm looking around at the other CEOs like two and a half hours in saying, hey, are we going to get a break here? <laughs> we kept going for five hours. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, they were looking for a path forward on how to do the, the, the structure of bailout. And I felt like at that hearing, that actually was policy being made at the hearing uh, and, uh, you know, had a, an impact, I think, on how people thought about that. So I take pride in that. Uh, you know, I, 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 that was a really you know, uh, interesting experience. But if I had to pick one experience where I thought I had you know, some inf significant influence, uh, real time influence, that would probably be the example. When we talk about Mathematica's work, we talk about the importance of Mathematica being advocates for evidence. Uh, and that is, we want to stay objective and nonpartisan in our work, and we want policymakers to incor incorporate evidence in their decision-making process. And it's it can be a, a tricky balance to strike in a politically charged environment, being objective, nonpartisan, and yet still being a uh, forceful and influential voice to drive the kind of impact that you just described. So I'm very impressed with how you do that. And I, I wonder, how do you strike that balance? And um, how do you maintain an objective nonpartisan posture while engaging in those policy debates? Oh, that's very kind of you to say, I appreciate that. Well, a few things. One, uh, I think all the work analysis, all your opinions has to be rooted in data and research. Uh, and you know, if you can point back to, you know, here's the, the data point or the time series, or here's the, you know, the kind of the preponderance of the economic literature, or, you know, you call upon institutions that are, uh, you know, nonpartisan, like the Congressional Budget Office, and they do fat, fat, I'm on the Board of Economic Advisors for CBO. And they do fabulous work, and if you can call upon that, you know that's uh, also very helpful. Helpful. Uh, second, uh, you know, I call it like I see it. You know, it's, I'm not going to say something that I don't believe in. Uh, I'm going to say things that uh, you know I believe in, and I try to I try to give people a sense of how confident I am in what I'm saying. Like some things I'm confident in, some not so much, and I try to make sure that people understand that. That you know, there's a you know this I feel really strongly about. I, I you know I'm confident in what I'm saying over here. Over here, I'm not so sure, but here here's my you know kind of view and in my opinion. And you know I'm not afraid to. You shouldn't be afraid to say something that the person you're talking to or the group you're talking to may not like. Uh, in fact, that adds credibility to what you're saying. I mean, if you agreed with everything that the other people were th saying or thinking, then that's not, that's just generally not credible. So the fact that you are saying something that's not, you know, kind of in their thinking that they, they, they would disagree with, uh, they, you know, that, then they, then they, they value and put more weight on everything else that you say, because they know that you're going to, you, you know, call it like you, uh, like you see it. And then the third thing is, you know, you need to be transparent and clear. Uh, you know, you just, you can't obfuscate. You can't try to. You're not a politician. I'm not a politician. I, you know, I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to be try to be as transparent in uh, the what I'm trying to say and how I got to what I'm trying to say, so that people know where I'm coming from. You know that kind of thing. And then you know, um, I think it's important to you know uh, um, get the message out there. You know, and and use those different platforms and media. Uh, venues uh, to get get you know get your views out there and express in a way 
that is, uh, cons you know, consistent with, you know, what you're trying to say, because everything can get spinned and you want to make sure that, you know, you have the platform and the, and the voice to get the, the message out that you're trying to get out uh, in a way you're trying to get it out there in the frame where frame that you, so they can't be, you know, uh, pushed in a certain direction that makes it less, less, uh, you know, makes it more biased and less useful. So all those things I think are, you know, important. And going back to all the different uh, media that and uh, bit, uh, platforms that, that I use, I mean, at the end of the day, a, a big part of that is to establish credibility because, you know, it, it, you don't, you're not, if you're not, if you're not, you know, uh, if people aren't quoting you, if you're not out there in, in the public domain and expressing views, uh, you don't have, you don't have a, you know, you're not credible. You don't have a, a brand and you need that brand and credibility uh, to be able to uh, establish, uh, you know, the, the trust in what you're saying and, and maintain that uh, unbiased, uh, the, per, the, per, the, the perception of being unbiased. You, you want to be unbiased, but it's also really key that there's a perception of being unbiased. And that goes back to your credibility and all those other things that we were talking about and that, that I do is an effort to establish and maintain that credibility. Yeah, I think you're characterizing it as brand is really important, but that takes consistent effort and recognizing that brand and, and taking action that makes that brand consistently recognized in the market. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Mathematica's brand is, you know, stellar, you know, gold-plated, and you guys work at it really hard, so, you, you know, you're really good at that. So, in talking about influence, uh, although you and I are committed to the evidence, as you know, in policymaking, there are lots of factors that enter into the picture and considerations. And uh, years ago, my friend Ron Haskins used to have a presentation where he had one of these pie charts uh, that was in, that was representing um, all the different factors that could play into policymaking. And the pie chart was intended to give you a sense of what were the most influential factors. And I think for research and evidence, I think that slice of the pie had representing about 1% of contribution <laughs> to the process. Is that right? I'd like to see that pie chart. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. So in, in reflection on that, do you see signs that data and evidence are becoming more central to the way the federal government works today? And are there areas where you'd like to see a stronger focus on data than we have right now? Uh, I'm surprised it was 1%. That's not my sense of it. Uh, you know, uh, I think data and, and the uh, kind of the uh, analytic, analytical basis for the policy that's making is absolutely critical uh, to success. Uh, I mean, I think to, to succeed legislatively, uh, there's a lot of elements to that for sure. And there's a lot of politics involved for sure, but the idea has to be a good one. Uh, it has to be rooted in something that is real and uh, in data and you know, research and, and analysis. And, and that's why uh, in Washington, there's so many different think tanks that are focused on just that, establishing the kind of uh, intellectual basis for the legislation that's being put forward. Now, and some some that kind of ebbs and it flows to some degree. I mean, you know, it depends on uh, kind of the political environment, who's president of the United States, and kind of their perspective on things. But you know, generally, I find that to be true. Uh, that you know, I think uh, lawmakers are very interested in 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 really focused on uh, you know what the data and uh, in in what the analysis and research say. So I find that I'm less jaded than than that uh one percent sounds too low to me i'd say maybe a third of the of the pie should be should be that way i don't i don't know that that's again it's ebbs and it flows i don't know that it's changed at least in my kind of 30-year experience with washington you know the nexus between economics and politics i i haven't noticed that changing in a kind of a trend-like way a structural way but it definitely ebbs and it flows you know sometimes it's more important sometimes not so much. Um, um, you know, I do think it would be very helpful if uh, there was more resources for be better data collection. I mean, one thing that's happening that's a real problem, and this is going to become a bigger issue going forward, is that the quality of the data is that we're using is starting to erode because 
most of it is, a lot of it is based on surveys and uh, survey response rates are way down across the board, not just government surveys, all surveys. A lot of uh, discussion, debate as to what's going on. You know, I'm sure some of it's survey fatigue. I, you know, I don't know about you, Paul, but, you know, everything I buy or every plane I get on or every car I rent or a hotel I go to, I get a survey saying, how did I do? Because everyone's focused on these so-called NPS scores and net pr promoter scores, that kind of thing. It's a way of evaluating their businesses kind of um, objectives and scorecards and that kind of thing. Um, there's concerns around privacy, you know, cyber issues, um, but for whatever reason, the response rates are way down and that's beginning to affect the, uh, the data to a significant degree. Uh, and that's why some, to some degree, I don't know if you, you said you, you listen to CNBC, so you, you're a consumer of economic information and data. Uh, you'll see, you'll, you may have noticed that there seems to be these big revisions to like the employment numbers that we get every month. And that partly goes to the fact that the response rates are low and the responses are lagged. Businesses are responding later and later to what's going on. Uh, and funding for government agencies that collect the data, clean the data, disseminate the data, uh, really has not kept up. In fact, in some degree, it's gone backwards. And so I think that's a really serious problem. We can't make good informed decisions. We can't do the kind of work we need to do to make good policy unless we have good underlying economic information and data. Now, fortunately, private institutions, companies, and other private institutions are, you know, kind of coming in and uh, creating their own sets of data. Like, for example, we use information from credit files uh, from the credit bureaus, uh, you know, anonymized, obviously. And Moody's has its own data consortiums. We collect a lot of data on how companies are performing, their balance sheets and income statements, and, you know, default on more, on uh, different types of loans and the kind of, and, and uh, that, that's helpful. Uh, and you can think of a lot of different other companies that are providing more information and data, but, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, uh, the government needs to be able to provide, you know, a, a, a consistent, um, a, uh, you know, uh, accurate uh, sets of data so that we can really understand what's going on. In fact, you can see it, the problem that's creating, just go over to the UK, the, the British can't even collect good unemployment rate data. And, you know, if you can't if you have a good fix on unemployment, how do you set monetary policy? So that's a real problem for them. And that's the direction we're headed here in the United States if we don't provide more funding and try to figure this out. So if I had one thing that, you know, the, had, uh, if I were king for the day and I could, you know, devote resources to one thing, that would be it. Let's go, you know, make, make our data sources uh, more resilient, the better, more comprehensive, more timely. Yeah. I think the other thing, in addition to uh, some of the private or big data sources uh, that you touch on, which can be the result of transactions that are tracked more than they've ever been in the past. The other factor that at least plays into our work is the, uh, in the availability of administrative databases um, that uh, are effective tools for research in ways that they weren't when my career started. Hmm. Uh, and so a lot of times when we're studying programs, we're studying it based on the database that's created by the program that's being run. Uh, so that's really changed the equation too, in terms of the data sources that we use. Yeah, I'm on the board of this uh, nonprofit. Maybe you've heard of them, the Coleridge Institute. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the, 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 it, is, it, it tries to facilitate the use of government data within the government, you know, state, local, federal, and, um, you know, set up uh, different uh, platforms for researchers to use data and share data, in, uh, government data uh, within the government. And I think that's, you know, it still hasn't gotten to scale, uh, and you probably know this space better than I, because I just recently joined the board. But you know, that feels like a you know a, a you know positive development to try to because there are a lot of silos within the government itself with regard to sharing information and data, which is you know very it would be very productive if we could break down those silos and allow uh, researchers to you know access different data sets across the government, uh, and I, that's the goal of the mission of the, the of Coleridge. Yeah. Mark, I'd also like to get some of your insights on the key policy issues uh, that we're working on and that we face as a country. Um, for a number of years, we've had an aging population in the United States, and 
this long-term trend has created downward pressure on the supply of workers, uh, also uh, has uh, uh, brought into question uh, whether we can provide adequate support for retirees through programs like Social Security and Medicare going into the future. Uh, I can remember when this was being predicted several decades ago in my Econ 101 class. So this is yeah. this threat has been with us for a long time, uh, and we're be and we we are feeling the effects of it. Um, now the pandemic may have exacerbated the problem in some ways by sending older workers into retirement earlier than expected, but it affected workers in other ways as well. But I'm curious as to how you see the future implications of our demographics for the labor market. Are the worker shortages uh, inevitable from those demographics? Uh, and what impact does the pandemic had on your thinking uh, around that trend? Yeah, as they say, demo I can't remember, you may know, Paul, who said demographics is destiny? I can't remember the, the uh, economist that said that, but uh, certainly uh, true. Uh, in the long run, demography determines a lot with regard to uh, the economy's performance and then everything else that depends on the economy's performance, like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the government's fiscal situation. And, uh, you know, abstracting from foreign immigration for a second, uh, you know, if immigration remained kind of consistent with what it, what it has been over the last, until recently, over the last uh, couple, three decades, about a million immigrants per, per annum, uh, uh, it, it, I, I, it appears that uh, we're going to suffer kind of perennial labor shortages because the, the native population is uh, is uh, because of the, of the aging of the of the population and the retiring of the baby boom generation, my generation. Uh, you know, labor force is uh, coming to a standstill and it's going to decline. So we've got this very significant. Uh, weight on uh, on uh, on working age population labor force that's going to create these uh, potential significant labor shortages, and to some degree we've been experiencing them already. I mean, even before the pandemic, uh, you know, back in 2018, 19, the number one business problem was uh, lack of labor. Uh, you know, unemployment was very low. Pandemic scrambled things, uh, but you know, exacerbated the labor problems. And here we are on the other side, and we still have a very tight uh, tight labor market and Again, if, unless abstraction from immigration, uh, you know, if you look forward, uh, th this is going to remain an issue, uh, a problem for for businesses and for the economy to grow. Now, having said that, um, uh, you know, there's two possible uh, wild cards here. Uh, one is immigration, and we've seen mass Im immigration, obviously, uh, in the last several years. The Congressional Budget Office, CBO, I mentioned them earlier, they came out with a uh, study, uh, outlook on uh, demographics, because as you rightly said, the budget, the, the future, the fiscal outlook, which the CBO is focused on, it depends on these demographic trends. They, they uh, estimated 3.3 million immigrants came into the country in 2023 on top of 2.6 million the year before. So remember, we were at a million pretty much every year, give or take, to, uh, both um, uh, uh, legal and undocumented, and now we're, last year we're three three. We're going to be at least that this year, and it's going to be you know very high for the foreseeable future. So, one way or the uh, we met one way at, uh, where this uh, kind of picture of a very tight labor market might might uh, change is if we see you know continued significant in migration in the country. Now, hopefully, we have re reform so that we have rational immigration, uh, we get the right kind of immigrants in the country, we're able to handle and manage the immigration that's, that's coming right now, it's unmanaged and creates enormous challenges to communities across the country and the nation. So there are benefits to it, but there's significant costs to it as well, and we could do a lot better there. And hopefully we, we will eventually do that, but immigration could be a way to you know, get more growth uh, and uh, address some of these longer term fiscal issues that you mentioned, uh, uh, given our, dem our domestic dem demography. The other obvious <clears throat> wild card is uh, technology, uh, artificial intelligence, and a lot of kind of hand-wringing about this. Uh, you know, there's a uh, uh, AI has, you've got folks on both sides of this. Some folks think AI is, is just great because it's going to improve labor productivity just enough to ensure that the labor market doesn't get so tight that it constrains our ability to grow. And goodness knows we want productivity growth. That's the key to you know, creating wealth and 
people's incomes and profits and and uh, is the, the fountain of uh, you know of uh, of our living standard of growth in our living standards. But the dystopic view is that the AI will come on so fast that it's going to wipe out all these jobs and we're going to have not a labor uh, labor uh, uh, problem with finding labor. The problem is going to be not enough work uh, because AI is going to take all those jobs. You know, uh, it hard to, it's a wild card, so hard to know. But, you know, if history is any guide, uh, it's more likely than not that AI is going to be more a plus than a negative. Uh, you know, that the technology is going to diffuse through the economy over an extended period of time, allowing labor productivity growth to improve uh, enough to help us out here, but not come on so fast that it's going to wipe out all these jobs and the problem is going to be high unemployment. So that's the, that's the um, lesson of history based on other technologies, the internet, electricity, all the other the big technolo technological innovations that have occurred in the last century. But but that that you know that is that is a concern. So that's another wild card. Um, you know those two things. Final thing I'll say, I think a prudent planner would plan on it's you know uh, we're going to go back to about a million immigrants a year. AI is going to be helpful, but not a game changer. And uh, the problem going forward is more likely going to be labor shortages than a surfeit of labor. But uh, but that's uh, you know a lot of uncertainty around uh, that that particular uh, forecast. Yeah, appreciate your flagging AI and immigration and, and maybe a third factor uh, uh, that doesn't have the same magnitude of impact is uh, work from home or workplace flexibility. Uh, I've been interested to see that the female labor force participation rate uh, is uh, higher than it's been historically. Uh, and uh, I'm sure some of that can be attributable uh, to the availability of people working from home uh in cases where they might otherwise drop out of the labor force so you're a proponent of remote work many CEOs well, we, we take a very flexible approach at yeah. mathematica um uh and partly for some of the reasons uh that relate to to the availability of the supply of talent mm -hmm. um and uh so rather than being one of those companies that uh kind of prods its uh, employees in three days a week or something like that we pretty much uh, leave it up to staff, mm. uh, but we provide the offices or the office space for those that want to work uh, in the office on a regular basis. And also recognizing that um, we want to continue to create connection uh, between our employees if it's an important part of the corporate culture. Um, and so, you know, we'll we'll navigate that over time. I didn't want to be in a position to assume that. Uh, because uh, the way we've been successful in the past is by being face-to-face -face on a regular basis, that that was the only way to do it going into the future. The uh, uh, individual preferences for flexibility is strong enough that I thought it was worth uh, at least seeing if we can uh, achieve uh, both benefits, both the benefits of flexibility, um, uh, but also make, finding ways to maintaining corporate culture, creating connection, even if we're not necessarily doing it daily on a face-to-face -face basis. Yeah, we're we're fully remote. The, not all of Moody's, but each unit can desert, decide what they want to do. But the economics team, you know, a couple hundred people around the world, we are fully remote. We decided to go fully remote. But, you know, there are interesting challenges because of the rest of the organization isn't quite, we're part of a large multinational, right? And if the rest of the organization isn't quite there, you know, it, it complicates things for, you know, for us because we can't take full advantage of being remote because of these constraints. I but uh, yeah, but it's interesting. And I, so far so good. I mean, we were basically fully remote since the pandemic hit based on our measures of productivity. And that's a whole other ball game, you know, how to measure productivity well feels like, you know, we're, you know, our, uh, nothing, we haven't, the productivity hasn't accelerated, hasn't decelerated, doing, and people are happier, so why not? Yeah, we'll that's see. our finding as well. Yeah. Thinking of one of uh, the issues that uh, you touched on, uh, on immigration, you highlighted uh, how it could be one of the solutions uh, to our labor shortage, and I agree with that. Uh, but the political conversation around immigration doesn't reflect that economic reality. So when you make the case for immigration or 
platform, have you found that there are specific data points or kinds of data that are particularly compelling in that discussion? Uh, and is there something you think can cut through that partisan gridlock on immigration? I don't think we can make much progress here until we kind of use the hackney phrase, secure the border. I mean, as long as you've got 3 million plus people coming across the border, uh, that literally, I don't know if you saw that 60 minutes uh, episode where they were, had a camera on one part of the border wall and people were just walking through. By the way, what I found so fascinating was it wasn't just kind of, you know, folks from Venezuela or other parts of Latin America. It was, a lot of Chinese, you know, middle class Chinese leaving China, coming in, you know, finding their way to Latin South America and making their way up. Uh, so I found that quite fascinating. But, you know, as long as that's the case, I, I don't think we can have a, a good rational conversation around this because it, it's just the creating such havoc in different communities across the country. You can see it in, you know, in New York and Chicago and San Francisco. You can see it in Florida and Texas. And that really makes the conversation very, very difficult and impossible to come to any kind of a resolution. So hopefully we can nail that down. And, you know, it felt like we were getting pretty close with a piece of legislation here recently, but that got shot down in the political process. And so we're not going to get at this go around, but hopefully on the other side of the election, we get something that helps, you know, the next president, you know, secure the border. And then if that's, once that happens, I think, uh, you know, I'm an economist and everything, I think of everything through the prism of economics. Uh, if we do have a tight labor market in shortage, perennial shortages, I think the politics will shift, right? I mean, if we have perennially low unemployment, then labor isn't going to be so concerned that the immigrants are going to take their job, and the jobs that are being taken aren't ones that they're going to use, they're going to want anyway. Uh, and businesses will clamor for you know rational immigration reform, uh, and um, and I think we'll get it. We came pretty close once in 2013, and I think we'll we'll get there again. And the data points that could really help are, you know, some the best data point, I think, are other examples. Like, go to look at Canada, look, you know, look at the Canadian, you know, immigration uh, process. It's pretty good, uh, and it's reaping an enormous benefit. The Canadian economy, you know, it has ups and its downs for lots of different reasons. It's tied to the U.S. economy, but, you know, the, the kind of underlying trend growth in that economy has improved dramatically because they're allowing a lot more immigrants in the right it's kind of the right, when I say right kind, kinds that are going to bring, um, you know, talents and skills. And although, you know, we need immigrants with all skill levels, you know, no skill to, you know, doctors and lawyers and uh, technicians and everything else. Um, but they're really good at it. So I think that's a, you know, if we have case studies of what, and then you go to other countries where they don't allow immigrants altogether. You go to like, a, a, like you know, like China, for example, or even in Japan, Germany has trouble with immigration. You can, uh, you know, create. You can see these contrasts between economies that are uh, allowing immigrants to come into the country in a rational way and those that don't. And the, the economic prospects, uh, economic performance, and prospects are very, very different. So I think that's probably, if I had, you know, one thing I could use to make the case, uh, I think that's a pretty compelling, uh, you know, set of information and data. You know, just looking cross country at what's going on and and looking at those immigration policies. Yes, I think the case of Canada conjures up a, a, a philosophy about this that we have to think a little bit more about being in competition uh, mm. for immigrants uh, as opposed to just focusing on the burden of immigrants. Mm. Uh, mm. Because um, as a business uh, leader who talks to other business leaders, um, business leaders are going to find the talent. Uh, and if they have to go overseas to find the talent, they will. Uh, and so, you know, it's better for the U.S. if we have them uh, doing the work over here and paying U.S. taxes uh, than if we just rely on people doing it remotely from other countries. Absolutely. I mean, I, I started an um, office in Prague uh, many, many years ago, you know, looking for talent, you know, Eastern European Folks are very talented, very technically competent uh, people, you know, uh, programmers and statisticians, data people, e economists, you know, economic modelers. And I hired this uh, one fellow and I couldn't get him. I was thinking about bringing him here, but it was very difficult to get a visa. So I said, okay, let's just, Prague's cheap. This was 15 years ago, and maybe even now longer, 20 years, almost 20 years ago. 
And it was very, you know, uh, cost effective and we set up shop there. And now we've got, you know, a huge office in Prague where, and that guy has now left and gone off and done other things. If that guy had come over here and done that here and, and gone off and done other things, he would create a boatload of jobs here, create a lot of income and wealth and tax revenue and so forth and so on. But the reason it didn't happen is because of our, you know, crazy immigration laws. Just, just yep. an example. Yep. You mentioned AI, and uh, obviously AI is a hot topic right now, and it's something I think you write about well, uh, and you've been doing it for a while now. So uh, uh, I appreciate your familiarity uh, with the technology. Y you talked a little bit about uh, projecting out uh, what it uh, may mean for the, for the changes in the labor market, and I agree with you that I think on balance, uh, the history, that the, the historical experience is that technology is a positive uh, in the labor market. How significant do you think the impact of AI will be in the labor market? You mentioned past technological advances like the internet. Is AI going to be bigger uh, than the impact of the internet? How do you see it? I, I think it's a big deal. I, I don't know that it's a, a game changer. Uh, it's not uh internet or electrification but you know it's going to show up in the data so just to give you context uh, uh we've increased uh our real gdp growth forecast uh over the next decade uh by about 15 basis points 0.15 percentage points on average over that 10-year period uh closer to zero over the next couple three years higher than that as you make your way into the second half of the decade. Uh, and, uh, you know, just, just to put that into clearer terms, without AI, say the economy would grow 2% per annum uh, over the next 10 years. With AI, uh, uh, with a boatload of assumptions, 2.15 percentage points. So you can, you say, one perspective is, oh, that's no big deal. Uh, 0.15 percentage points per annum is, adds up to real money. So that's consequential. And, that, and, it, and I, that's, that's additive, you know, that's juice on top of it. So it's going to be, product, the productivity boost from AI is going to be more than 0.15, but that's 0.15 above the, you know, the kind of the typical without, uh, without uh, uh, you know, uh, that added boost. Uh, and, and so it, it's it's consequential, but I don't think it's game changing. You know, it's not like we're going to restructure big parts of the economy uh, wholesale because of you know the influence of AI. And and I again I say this going back to an earlier point that some things I'm confident in, some not so much. This is the not so much. Yeah. It's very difficult to gauge, and I'm relying on histor historical experience here and other. Uh, you know, I think of it more like. Uh, wire, I, I, I think of it, it's not the internet, but it's kind of like wireless, you know, wireless was important and it did add, it add a lot to economic growth, but it wasn't this game changing thing. The other thing is, I mentioned this earlier, I'll just mention it again, it takes a while for uh, the, the, the technology to kind of diffuse through the economy. And in fact, initially it could be counterproductive, like, you know, take our business, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to use AI, but we haven't yet, but we've invested in trying to figure out how to use AI. That's lowering productivity. That's not adding to productivity. Now, right. that's, I expect that to change. I think it's a really good investment to make. We have to make it, but at least initially, it's more of a restraint than a, you know, a source of growth. Uh, and then ultimately, the real benefit to any technology, and I think this is gonna to apply to AI, is when new businesses form and optimize around the new technology around AI. Because existing businesses, when they try to gerrymander what they're doing to the new technology, they don't quite get it right. They don't have the right people. They don't have the right resources. You have to restructure your organization and that's difficult to do. But if you're a new company starting de novo, you can say, oh, okay, let's, we'll organize this way. We'll, use, we'll make these kinds of investments because this will optimize, you know, this technology. And so I think that just takes time, you know, as new businesses form, they're gonna optimize, just like they're gonna optimize around remote work in general. I don't think anyone's gonna optimize around a traditional office space. That just doesn't, I just don't think that's gonna work. 
uh, I, I think they're going to, they're going to, uh, people are going to, uh, the new business is going to optimize around the use of AI and other technologies. And that's when you get the productivity gains. And that's why it takes, it's diffused through time. It's not this game changing. We're going to get a five percentage point increase in productivity in one year. It's something that's spread out over time as that, as that, uh, as that, as new businesses form. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Um, but again, I, I say it with a, you know, a lot of intrepidation because, you know, forecasting, you know, uh, how technologies evolve and how they're adopted by businesses is, and whether that less productivity or not is a pretty intrepid affair. One of the things that's different about AI versus past disruptions is the degree to which it uh, represents change uh, in the labor market. That is the group that uh, uh, expects to be affected uh, is different than the profile of workers uh, mm. that expected to be uh, affected in the past. So AI is expected to have an impact on uh, uh, workers that are in occupations where they're highly educated, highly skilled, highly paid, uh, and that could have unique pressures uh, versus past disruptions. But I, w I wonder how you're already seeing it in our field in terms of how it's changing our work around uh, data-driven social science. The biggest change is around the um, the uh, value I think companies are placing on data itself, the underlying you know fodder for the AI. I mean, AI only is tr works and trained on underlying information and data, and so that has enhanced the kind of the the value of that underlying information and data. And so I think businesses are really focused on oh, what are my data assets? What are my you know uh, what are my uh, analytical assets? You know, what do I have that could be useful to training, you know, AI to you know perform you know functions better? So that and you know, companies are working on. I mentioned the data consortiums and uh, you know trying to get uh, working together to come up with bigger data sets and information platforms so that they can use that to train their you know AI um, uh, algorithms. Uh, and then I, I do think uh, the other thing that's going on is it, we are investing. You know, I think businesses are starting to invest in people and in the technology necessary. That's why NVIDIA is now worth $2 trillion because everyone's buying their chips, you know, to drive these AI engines. And so we're making a lot of investment, uh, you know, at that, in, in that. Uh, and then uh, I do think a lot of experimentation is going on, uh, you know, uh, trying to, I think, uh, the kind of the easy, the next easy step is to come up with AI tools that you know are helpful in guiding users through the uh, you know the blizzard of information and data that companies have. Like Moody's is like this. I I can't even keep up with all the things that we've got. All it's all over the place. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. I go, oh, whoa, what's that? <laughs> you know, I didn't know. It. Like you know. Detailed information on foreign direct investment. Uh, where, where uh, really we collect that information and data? I, I didn't even know that. But we're so we're we're creating AI uh, tools to be able to you know t uh, understand that information and data, bring that all together in a way that we can use it in a more more effectively. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, you know uh, gu AI guides, you know, things to help us do that. So those are the kinds of steps we're taking so far. Um, uh, and, and there's a lot of incentive to do it because it, shareholders are enamored by, you know, companies that are able to take, you know, show that they're taking advantage of AI and, and, and improving the kinds of services and information they provide and also improving productivity. So there's, you know, a lot of interest uh, in, in pursuing it. So I think I expect a lot of good things to happen here in the not too distant future. But th those are the steps that have been taken, at least in my experience, that have been taken so far. Mark, I rarely have uh, discussions with folks that are experts uh, at your level on macroeconomics. So I've got one final question. It has yeah, to do with fe away. federal debt. Yeah. Um, and as an organization that's dependent on federal spending for a lot of the work we do, uh, you can understand my interest. Uh, we now have accumulated U.S. debt. Uh, it's surpassed $34 trillion, uh, which is equivalent to 123% of annual GDP. And I don't, I presume that's the record um, for that ratio. If it's, if it's not, it's at least the record probably in non-war times. Yeah. 
what do you think is the most likely end game for U.S. debt and budget deficits? Can we simply grow our way out of this current predicament, or is there something is is there something that's going to happen in the future that uh, we should begin worrying about? Well, this is a problem. I mean, going again, going back to CBO, uh, they do projections of the fiscal situation, that debt to GDP ratio you were talking about. And if there's no change in policy, you know, we just take existing policy and extrapolate forward, uh, the outlook is uh, daunting. Uh, the debt to GDP ratio is going to rise about 80 percentage points over the next 30 years. Uh, and that, that's when the forecast ends. And you can do your own forecast after that. It's just going to continue to grow very, very rapidly. And uh, that means that we're going to be paying increasing uh, amounts on uh, just the interest on that debt. Uh, that uh, uh, that's already the interest is a share of GDP or interest is a share of tax revenues already rising you know, here pretty quickly. In fact, I think we're pretty close. If I have my facts straight, someone can check it. The amount of interest we pay on the debt is pretty close to our uh, budget on on defense. Uh, so. You know, I think as that happens and people recognize that the that it makes no sense. Like, do we do, really we're spending more on an interest than we are on, on our own defense? And in fact, half of that interest goes to foreign investors, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Middle East, UK, not just American investors. People, are, I think, are going to say that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, we, we should do something about this. And, you know, the. I, I don't know exactly how this plays out, but if history is a guide, we come up to some kind of period where there's a forcing mechanism where people, lawmakers have to come together and make some decisions. And in, at that point in time, they'll make some decisions that will start to bend that forecast and make it you know, more manageable going forward. So for example, in early 2025, after the next presidential election, we're gonna have to raise the debt limit again that's a forcing mechanism. The Trump tax cuts for high income, high net worth households, they expire at the end of 25. Something has to be done about that. Obamacare tax subsidies come due, they, and uh, that has to be uh, resolved. So uh, I sus that, that would be a, a point in time when lawmakers will have to make some decisions and can make some decisions. And uh, they don't have to make big ones right away just things to kind of bend that curve and make it moving in the right direction and hopefully show the the world that you know we do have a strong enough governance structure that we don't do stupid things like you know, shut the government down or you know bre god forbid you know breach the debt limit um now having said that it, it, to really solve this problem or you know, address it sufficiently so it's a problem for you know two generations down the road and you know, that's okay because things happen and who knows. Um, uh, we may need to see some kind of, when I say forcing event crisis, you know, where uh, bond investors say, hey, guys, you know, I'm afraid you're not going to pay me back on time. You're going to have to pay me a higher interest rate to compensate for that risk. And you see interest rates really jump and take off and stay up. They don't go up and come back down. They go up and stay up. And that may be necessary because, you know, to, for lawmakers to connect the dots, in the minds of the electorate as to why we need to change our fiscal path, they need something to point to and say, look, if we don't change our fiscal path, this is economic ruin. And you can see it right here in that we're paying six, 7% on a 10 year treasury bond. So we may need to see something like that to you know, generate the political will necessary to do it. But Paul, I, I'll say one last thing. And I'm gonna butcher it, but a quote from, uh, from Winston Churchill said something like, uh, you know, Americans, and this is, he's talking about uh, back in World War II, trying to get the Americans into, into World War II and help him out. Uh, he goes, Americans, they'll, they'll try anything and everything, and then they'll ultimately do the right thing. <laughs> now, that's not exactly what he said, but that's what he meant. <laughs> and, you know, based on my 30 years, you know, uh, between the nexus of an economy and politics and observing what's and uh, trying to participate in with what's going on in Washington, D.C., I firmly believe that to be true. We try everything. We look down every road, every path. We, you know, game out every single scenario. And then ultimately, you know, we come up with something that works. So, uh, you know, I think that's the history of America. And I think that's the history we should expect. That should be the future that we should expect for the United, for, for our country. 
That's great. I love ending on a Winston Churchill quote. <laughs> there you go. Thank, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Paul. You're very kind. Mark, thanks for your insights. I appreciate your uh, uh, being able to manage a wide range of topics as well as you do. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, could you share with our listeners where we can find you each week? Yeah, I, uh, you mentioned my podcast. It's uh, Inside Economics. Uh, it's on all the platforms, so you can find that. We do that every week. I'm on Twitter, uh, at Mark Zandy, and you can find us. Uh, we put, I publish a lot of stuff uh, free and paid on uh, economic, a website called Economic View, uh, and we cover all the indicators around the world. Uh, uh, but the, you know, post a lot, I post a lot of my articles, kind of more deeper thought pieces on, on there for free, so people might be able to enjoy that website as well. So those are, those are some, good, some good ways to kind of stay in touch. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Thanks to our guest, Mark Zandi, and thanks to Mathematica's Paul Decker for stepping in as the guest host for this episode. Last month, we celebrated the five-year anniversary of Mathematica's On the Evidence podcast. Whether this is the first time you're hearing us or you've been with us since 2019, thanks for listening. If you're a fan of the show, please consider leaving us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. To catch future episodes of the show, subscribe at mathematica.org slash on the evidence.